You have reached the Geek Elite. Good luck. In my lifetime, I expect to see three, four, perhaps even more women on the high court bench. Women not shaped from the same mold, but of different complexions. Welcome back to another episode on season three of the United States of Women, New Jersey. Woohoo! Jersey. Jersey. This is the Geek Elite Media podcast all about awesome women of U.S. history. Mm -hmm. The way this works Mm -hmm. is every season we cover a new state and eight fantastic women of that history who, while you may not have heard about them, you have definitely heard about their accomplishments. Mm -hmm. So as always, I'm Elizabeth and I am joined by the fantabulous or the, what did we, what did we decide last week? Jubilous? Jubil, jubiltastic. Jubiltastic. (laughs) The jubiltastic Jessica. Mm -hmm. If any listener out there has got a better adjective for me that goes with a J, I am all ears. (laughs) (laughs) Um, but it does have to match Jessica's personality, so just got to be paying attention. <laughs> so, Jessica, yes, are you ready for our next woman? Yes, I think so. So this week, yes, we are going to talk about. I'm giving her the title of historian of the forgotten, which isn't quite right, but I can't think of a better way. Like, I had toyed with the historian who would not be held back, or the mm-hmm. historian. Of histories denied. Mm. So I'm going with historian of the forgotten. Okay. I get that she's a historian. (laughs) Yes. Which is really important and probably it's half of the most important. Anyway, we'll get into it. Okay. So today we are talking about Marion Thompson Wright, who was born September 12th, 1902 in East Orange, New Jersey. Okay. Okay. She was the youngest of four, um, and her parents separated basically right after she was born. Wow. So her mother raised all four kids as a single mom. Wow. Working as a, as it's stated, as a domestic servant in white households around East Orange. Hmm. Noted strictly due to the time period, mm-hmm. and it's important regarding her accomplishments, Marion is African-American. Got it. Okay. So, yeah. I see the working at white households. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. Again, it's one of those in this podcast, we often deal with the fact that history is not kind, Mm -mm. particularly to our protagonists and these amazing women. Mm -hmm. Um. And the terminology is not terminology you and I are particularly comfortable with. Mm -hmm. Because this is a history podcast, I have a need to adequately reflect the terminology of that day. Uh I am going to give a disclaimer on this episode. Uh A term that I am not particularly comfortable with, but is the way it's titled or stated in some things are going to be said so... It's not really a trigger warning, but I just, I want to put that disclaimer out there. Mm-hmm. We are going to use the term Negroes oh, in this okay. podcast. Oh. Not a term I'm particularly comfortable with, but it's accurate to Marion's statements and Marion's titled works. So it's what Marion would write herself, because that was the term that they were using at the time. Correct. Whereas now it's considered a more... Taboo of, word. Offensive word. More offensive word. There you go. Not taboo. So, offensive. but because as we will get to, she is historian. She wrote articles and m- most of her articles use the term Negroes in the title. Okay. So I'm just, I'm, those are the titles of the works and those are the titles that I'm going to give them because uh-huh. I think it would be a disservice to change the titles of her work. So she's the one who wrote them. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> So, not much is known about Marion's childhood. 
other than she attended Beringer High School in Newark, New Jersey. Mm-hmm. And she was one of only she was one of only two black students in the entire high school. Okay. Okay. Cool. Her mom was very focused on Marion's education and interest in learning. At the age of 16, she married William Moss and had two kids. Because at the time, women were not permitted to enter university if they were married or divorced. Right. We only went to university to get married. (laughs) She left her kids with her husband to pursue her high school degree and then higher education, Mm -hmm. but kept her status as a married woman a secret. Wow. So nobody knew. Cool. Yeah. So she graduated high school and then she attended Howard University, where she graduated with a degree in sociology. So Howard University is our topic of today. Mm -hmm. Howard University was founded in 1867, Mm -hmm. just after the history, just after the Civil War. Um, And since then, it has awarded over 100,000 degrees in the professions of arts, sciences, and humanities. Hmm. That's according to Howard University itself and their history tab. Okay. Okay. Um, In November 1866, members of the First Congressional Society of Washington Mm -hmm. wanted to establish, thought they'd establish a seminary for black priests, preachers, clergymen within a few weeks they basically decided no 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 we're going to establish a whole university now by a whole university we're talking about one building building. okay (laughs) a single building okay but within two years it would consist of two colleges a college of liberal arts and a college of medicine oh that's cool right uh so the university's in charter was Enacted by the U.S. Congress, because at Mm. that time, Congress had to charter new schools Mm. Um, and president and approved by President Andrew Johnson on March 2nd, 1867. And it was designated as a university for the education of youth in the liberal arts and sciences. Most of its early funding came directly from private organizations grants and tuition of the students it's considered a private college right it is okay but it does get a little more interesting than that Mm. um as we get down there so it was named after general oliver otis howard who was a civil war hero and was one of the founders of the university and was at the time a commissioner for the freedmen's bureau Mm -hmm. okay to be clear, as near as I can tell, based on historical context, General Otis Howard, however, was not the first African-American president of the university. He would, however, later serve as president. In its first five years of operation, Howard University educated over 150,000 freed slaves. Mm-hmm. Which is where I got confused by Howard University's statement that they have issued over a hundred thousand degrees. Cause I'm like, well, you did 150,000 in the first five years, <laughs> but maybe I'm missing something. Maybe there were some more zeros there that were the zeros that were supposed to be there. I don't know. I, I don't know. Beats me anyway. Um, the Christian general. Sorry. Yeah. I started looking up Otis Howard and he's nicknamed as the Christian general. Sorry. I think okay. they're like, what is Howard? Who is he in Civil War? Because there's so many generals to keep up. <laughs> Real ridiculous <laughs> amount. Howard. He, has, he's got, he has a very nice beard. <laughs> so um, during the la- la- last part of the 19th century, many improvements were made to the campus. Mm-hmm. Um, Howard Hall, which was the first building, was renovated and was made a dormitory for women. Ooh, cool. Right. Women. So... In 1926, Howard University received its first African-American president of the college. Mm -hmm. And that was Dr. Mordecai Wyatt Johnson, Sr. Best name ever. (laughs) 
<laughs> I absolutely love the name Mordecai. Like to the point, I I would possibly name my son Mordecai. Like, I love that name, even though I know it's probably not a nice name to name your son. I mean, it's definitely a little rough for yeah, them, but, but I, I I do get it. <laughs> so in 1928. The school's charter was amended to authorize an annual federal appropriation for Mm -hmm. construction, development, improvement, and maintenance on the university. That's why I said private, but there's twists. There's twists. Okay. Okay. When Dr. Mordecai was the first, was president, Mm -hmm. the institution's enrollment stood at 1,700 and its budget stood at $700,000. By the time he retired... 34 years later, the university boasted 10 schools and colleges, all which were fully accredited. Mm -hmm. Most of them hadn't been accredited prior to his taking the presidentship, Mm -hmm. presidency. Um, 6,000 students, up from 1,700, and a budget of $8 million. Wow. (laughs) Right? He was booking it. So. The reason I specifically am talking about him is this is the time that Marion Thompson Wright would have been in play because she graduated in 1927. So she was just at the front end of his term. Some of the other main highlights. So Howard University obviously played a very important role during the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. Okay. Prior to that, during the Great Depression... I need to do this in the right order, not just based off of what's most interesting to me. Okay, (laughs) Great Depression. So 1930s, Eleanor Roosevelt was a huge proponent of Howard University. She was fully Mm gung-ho. And she lobbied Congress to prevent having Howard University's budget cut completely. Unfortunately, it was cut down past the previous uh, Herbert Hoover Hoover levels. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, during the first couple terms of FDR's mm. presidency, just because of the Great Depression and general lack of budget. Um, but it would grow again. They played an important role in the civil rights movement. In 1942, Howard students uh, pioneered the stool sitting technique um, used for sit ins at restaurants and oh. grocery stores the the actual concept of just sitting in a stool silently mm-hmm. as as a way to take up space and really move the movement forward yeah making no reaction which Correct. that was like i don't want to say there's my favorite things about the civil rights movement but that was one of my favorite protests of the civil rights movements were the sit-ins because i mean they had to practice it mm-hmm. and cuz it's not I don't want to say it's not natural, but it's really hard to just sit still while people are yelling at you, pulling your hair and doing all this stuff, trying to yank you from the chairs and all that stuff. But they like it just was really pronounced how they I don't even know. It was just such a good yeah movement. It was very like, impactful. It was just very, there you go. It was very impactful. And yeah. So in 1965, um, President Lyndon B. Johnson, LBJ, delivered a speech to the graduating class of Howard where he outlined his plan for civil rights legislation Mm -hmm. and the Civil Rights Act. Mm -hmm. Um, And an additional, and he endorsed aggressive affirmative action, um, which is really where you start to get the scene of this. Mm -hmm. Obviously, Howard has continued to be a very impactful university. um, And as of right now, the it is on U.S. News's list of best colleges. Mm-hmm. So it it makes the list basically every year. In 1975, the Freedmen's Hospital. So that was one of those first. You know, the College of Liberal Arts and the College of Medicine, Freedmen's mm-hmm. Hospital, closed after 112 years of use as Howard University's College of Medicine's primary teaching hospital. Obviously, I could spend the next four hours trying to dive into Howard University's history Uh and the importance of it. So this is just kind of to give audiences a general overview. I highly recommend everybody go and research some more because I think that 
particularly Howard University, but a lot of American universities and colleges have histories that are worth learning about. Hmm. But I do want to get back to Marion. Yes. Marion graduates Howard University, mm-hmm. 1927, degree in sociology. Mm. She then goes on to Columbia University Teachers College to get a master's in education and in history. Okay. Okay. Uh, while there, she worked with Muriel Curti, who was the U.S. best, like, top end historian at the time. Cool. Right? The Great Depression hits. Hmm. After she gets her master's, so she begins to work for the Newark Department of Welfare and then the New Jersey Emergency Relief Organization, while at the same time writing her PhD's dissertation, um, which was the education of Negroes in New- the history of the education of Negroes in New Jersey. Hence the reason why I need to use that term. She receives her Ph.D., and the article is published in 1940. She is the first African-American woman to earn a Ph.D. in U.S. history at that time. Or a Ph.D. at that time. Hmm. While doing all of this, she divorces William Moss, Hmm. moves her two kids in with her mother so she can go for the Ph.D. Mm -hmm. She marries and then divorces Arthur Wright, which is where... Marion Thompson Wright comes from. Comes from. Okay. Okay. After getting her PhD, she went back to teach at Howard University. Okay. I did, okay. okay. I I just like to know. I kind of laughed because the way you said it is like she married and divorced the right guy solely to get his name. Like it's like just, <laughs> just the way you said it. She married and divorced him, and that's how she became right. <laughs> Well, I mean, quite literally in all of the articles, he is like, maybe a sense. And she got his name from this guy. <laughs> she made like, it's literally like, it. okay. Sh- and it was like, wait, what just happened? <laughs> <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> so, so I guess she was a historian, but she didn't really write about herself to explain. Okay. No, why? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, basically she was like autobiographies. What the fuck are those? Uh, that's not what's important. From there, so she goes back to teach at Howard University. Mm -hmm. And all of this time, as you could probably tell from the title of her dissertation, Mm -hmm. she is very focused on the disparities in education between white and black students. Mm -hmm. Basically everywhere across the country. Okay. And she would publish dozens of of articles on this very topic. While at Howard, she also uh, established the Negro History Bulletin through 1961. um, Hmm. And it was a publication done at at Howard University. Cool. All right. Her work then became the foundational uh, argument factual argument for the NAACP's argument in Brown v. the Board of Education. Her research being the foundation showing that separate but equal wealth created disparities. So it was her research that basically established the factual foundation for that legal argument. I feel like that argument needs to be remade because although schools aren't segregated anymore intentionally, they're still very segregated at the same time. They are still very segregated, yes. Yes. Um, Because intentional, not intentional. Oh, yeah, that's true. We could do an entire... We shouldn't assume they're not... Yeah, I don't know. (laughs) There's a a very interesting documentary on Netflix that points it out, and I can't remember the name of it because I watched it early on in COVID. Because it's still a problem. Don't get me started on early child care. (laughs) Yeah. So she would continue to write and research... um, focused very much on that topic Mm -hmm. had so we've been discussing a lot of her professional Mm -hmm. achievements Mm -hmm. which are very important she did not really have any personal life fights she had to fight and the battles she had to win um most of the articles describe her as being very lonely and in fact she died um, of suicide at the age Aww. of 60 
on October 26, 1962. So that is Amazing Life and the Unfortunate Death of Marion Thompson Wright, the historian of the forgotten. Mm-hmm. At the Howard University Library and online mm-hmm. um, were obviously hugely important in shining a light on the disparities of education and that connection between history and education, Mm -hmm. which I think is so important. Citations for today's episode. Obviously, I pulled Marion Thompson right from the New Jersey uh, Women's History by Samuel Momodo. Momodo? Mm -hmm. Um, As of December 2016, on blackpast.org, which was really, really great. Again, Google Books came to my rescue with the the book Past and Present, Mm. uh, The History of New Jersey Women. The uh, Association for the Study of African American Life and History has good information on the uh, Negro history bulletin. All of the publications from those bulletins can be found on JustOr, which is an online database. Also pulled her Wikipedia article because there was some good confirmation information. Also appreciated at, from Howard University, they have a separate article, um, A Brief History of Howard, which was published by the university itself mm. pulled it off the way back machine yeah. which is always good um just or also has got a pretty good article from clifford l muse howard university and the federal government during presidential administrations of herbert hoover and franklin delano roosevelt uh the lbj presidential library has that commencement address mm. and then howard university's uh website itself for under there they have a a, under the about they have a history Hmm. tab which had some interesting stuff fantastic and if you want to reach out to me uh correct anything expound on anything give me any sources that you have or topics that you'd love to hear about feel free to tweet at me at geek elite media and our facebook page forward slash geek elite media Archived episodes of this podcast and other podcasts can be found on our website, geekleetmedia.com. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe to us on whatever podcatcher you use. It helps other people find us. But until next time, this is the ladies of United States of Women, the Geek Elite Media Network, saying always remember to geek geek out. This concludes our broadcast. 